Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here, and I'm really excited to talk to you about Hashimoto's 101. So for starters, I want to talk about the big picture of thyroid disease and how Hashimoto's fits within that. The main three categories we've got are hypothyroidism, where the gland is underactive, hyperthyroidism, where the gland is overactive, and then thyroid cancer, where the cells in the gland are growing in ways that are just not helpful. And hypothyroidism being underactive, I want to talk about the relationship between that and Hashimoto's. So hypothyroidism, to define this really well, is just where the gland is not making enough hormones to meet your body's needs. And that's causing some changes in health, some changes in blood values, some symptoms, or some combination of those things. That's hypothyroidism. Now, if there were a I don't know, some evil gremlin that had a magic wand and like made your thyroid disappear, you would be hypothyroid, in fact, dangerously so. But the reality is hypothyroidism occurs almost always from Hashimoto's. Now, what about the person who says, hey, I'm hypothyroid, but I don't have Hashimoto's? I want to go into that, that statement. I heard that one so much. So let's dig deeper. What that usually means is my doctor said I don't have Hashimoto's. Okay, cool. Let's dig deeper on that. What that usually means is my doctor tested maybe one out of my three antibodies and found it negative or found it below a certain threshold. What does that really mean? Well, we talk about things being a rule out in medicine, meaning if you don't have this finding, then you don't have this condition. So a really simple one would be something like high blood pressure. If you go measure my blood pressure and it's 110 over 60, I do not have high blood pressure. That is a perfect rule out. So do thyroid antibodies rule out Hashimoto's? Um, no, they just don't. I've seen papers say that anywhere from 40% to half of people who have Hashimoto's do not have thyroid antibodies high ever. And another group of people may not have them high at one point in time. So they may come and go, but when you measure, perhaps they were negative. That can occur for most people with Hashimoto's. At any given point in time, they don't have measurable antibodies. So please know that, that when someone says you don't have Hashimoto's and they're basing it upon the antibodies, that's not a valid conclusion to draw. So how do we know if you're hypothyroid, if you've got it from Hashimoto's? Well, honestly, if there's not another obvious reason, we assume it's Hashimoto's. So another obvious reason would be thyroidectomy. Your gland was removed for some surgical concern, most commonly a risk for thyroid cancer. That's one. Another thing would be a medication that shuts off your thyroid. There's not many of these. There are some. Uh, lithium is a big one. Amiodarone is another. There's a couple of others that are pretty rare, but really those two are the majority. So if you're on lithium for mood symptoms or amio amiodarone for cardiac irregularity, those can cause hypothyroidism without Hashimoto's. Now, a wrinkle in that is they can also precipitate Hashimoto's. They can also cause someone to develop Hashimoto's. So even in those cases, it may be Hashimoto's that the medication then caused to happen. Now, another non-Hashimoto's cause of hypothyroidism is something that we don't see really occur anymore. It's mostly people who were around in the 50s when radiation was used to treat sore throats or tonsillitis. <laughs> that could also damage the thyroid and cause it to shut down. Also a big risk factor for thyroid cancer. Uh, but in those cases, Hashimoto's may not have been the culprit. That same wrinkle with medications to where they could trigger Hashimoto's, that also applies to radiation. Radiation can also trigger Hashimoto's. So it may be the cause even if there was an obvious trigger. So let's assume there was not an obvious trigger like a medication or radiation. Well, then what causes Hashimoto's? There's some perfect storm between genetic susceptibility, environmental toxicants, and then immune stressors. So genetic susceptibility, your genes are prone to develop thyroid disease given the right circumstances. And those circumstances could be too much or too little iodine. Those circumstances could also include the buildup of toxicants within the thyroid. And the genes affect how selective the gland is for pulling in iodine. So when your gland, when your gland is less selective, it'll pull in all kinds of junk from the environment at the same time it's absorbing iodine for your thyroid. So the combination is susceptibility and exposure. 
there's a big list of hundreds of chemicals that are shown to be precipitators of Hashimoto's. So if you're susceptible and you're exposed, or if you're not susceptible but you're really exposed, it happens. On the other hand, maybe you're extremely susceptible and you're barely exposed. That can also make it happen. So if those things make it prone to occur, then some immune stressor makes it occur, makes it apt to start. So this makes it likely, and this is like the, the pushing the plunger on the dynamite. <laughs> so you've, you've got the dynamite, you've got the cable on the dynamite, and then the immune stress pushes the plunger, so it happens now. That immune stress could be as simple as hay fever. It could be a liver infection. It could be Epstein-Barr. It could be the change of pregnancy on your immunity. So some kind of an immune stressor precipitates it. But the gene susceptibility and the burden of toxicants, those are all the things that set it up. They set the stage for it. So to be really precise, how do you know if you have it? If you've got low thyroid disease and no other cause, that's, that's the most likely scenario. Some things that rule it in would be thyroid antibodies. So the absence of them do not rule it out, but the presence of them do rule it in. I'm not sure if my grammar was smooth through all that, but if you've got positive thyroid antibodies, you've got Hashimoto's. There can also be signs on ultrasound that rule that in as well. The next big question about Hashimoto's is, am I stuck with this? Does this have to persist forever? Well, there's been some data looking at the natural progression of Hashimoto's. And I've looked at this, and it's approximately what I call the rule of quarters. So about a quarter of people, 20-25%, it seems that regardless of what they do, it's going to go away. They will move out of Hashimoto's. They will have normal thyroid function. And it doesn't matter what they eat or what color socks they wear or if they stand on their head. It's just going to do that. That's just the disease progression. Now, another quarter of people, it's going to stay pretty stable and steady. So it's going to make this up. Say their gland shuts down by about a quarter. So it's a little bit underactive. And they need perhaps a small amount of thyroid replacement. This group of people is always going to be there. It's going to slow down a little bit and just stabilize right there. Another quarter of people tend to do something a bit different to where they progress a ways and then keep on creeping down. The gland keeps on slowing until at some point it really shuts off. And then the last group, they slow down initially and they go down another step and then they stay there long term and they're good. <laughs> so that's just the default response. That's not doing anything strategic. That's not taking care of yourself, detoxifying, being on the best types of treatment, you know, eating well, being on the right micronutrients. So that's just what it does anyway. And it's, that's kind of an optimistic message because all the things that you do that are helpful, they really improve your odds. And they really push your odds towards the, the milder outcomes. But the one thing I want to preface is that in all of those outcomes, however the gland plays out, if you do all the healthy, healthy steps and take care of yourself, you can still reverse the symptoms. So that progression was just really, do you need medication long term, is what that portion was about. In any of those scenarios, you can do better and have those symptoms go away and feel like you did before it started. So how do you help reversing this and how do you raise the odds of you not needing longer term treatment? Well, the starter thing is you want to know what you're dealing with. Be sure that this is Hashimoto's. Sometimes Hashimoto's and Graves overlap. It's a little bit different. You want to have good control of your TSH. When that's not too high and not too low, there's a sweet spot that gives your gland the best odds of really fixing itself. You want to make sure you're not taking any harmful supplements. Iodine, folic acid, top two on that list. You want to be sure that you are getting some helpful supplements. Selenium, uh, methylfolate, manganese, critical things that way. Magnesium. You want to be on the best foods, get your tummy working really well, detox your body, help fix the daily rhythms, manage those immune stressors, which are the allergies and the chronic infections. So the better you do about really clearing out all those root causes, the better your odds are about being in that group to where this whole thing calms and reverses itself. So that's all about Hashimoto's. I'm Dr. Alan Christensen, and I'll talk with you again really soon. Bye-bye.